Welcome to the uh, Waterstones interesting hangout. Um, I'm Dane from socialbookshelves.com. Uh, I'm a book blogger. I read lots of books. Uh, with my reviews, I do them so that the word count of the reviews is the same as the number of pages in the book as well. Just because otherwise, oh, really? I, yeah. Well, well, otherwise, otherwise you get a really small book and you have to write a really long review, or the other way around, you get a really long book and you kind of feel as though you, you need, you've got more to say about it. Yeah. Um, it gets really difficult when it's like a book that's 40 pages long or whatever. Yeah. So I've also been doing sort of um, uh, like author interviews and stuff recently, but just because I love reading all the time, I think that's why I wanted to vlog. Yeah. What about you guys? Penny? Oh, <laughs> you go first, Jane. Okay. Um, I'm Jane. Um, I blog at Is That You Darling, um, which is kind of a lifestyle slash book blog. I um I used to be more lifestyle and just in the last six months or so I thought, you know what, I do read I just read so much and reading is like the one thing that I love that I thought I might as well make my blog more about more, more like, you know, about me basically. So I thought just write more about books. So I'm trying to review um well I've I've reviewed haven't reviewed everything I've read this year, but I'm trying to review um, from like last month I'm trying to review everything. Um so yeah, and I've got loads of different like reading goals. Like I want to read seventy-five books this year, and I'm trying to read um, ten non-fiction, at least ten non-fiction books between my birthdays, and also ten books from the year I was born, which is proving difficult because there's not that very many good ones. But giving it a go. That's a wicked idea. I like that. I might try and do that. But yeah. I, again, I, I don't know how you'd uh, have to go on Wikipedia and see what came out, wouldn't you? Yeah, just like searching. Goodreads is quite good as well because it's there's like lists on there. So I found like loads of lists, well a couple of lists of books from 1982, but um I haven't found one that I've really enjoyed yet. So still searching. How many have you read so far from that year? Um, three I think. I read one which was oh, I can't remember who it was by. Oh Chuck Bukowski, which oh it was too uh too uh depressing for me. And then I read a Jeffrey Archer one. Which I was a bit like, I'm reading Jeffrey Archer, but it was it's quite enjoyable. Yeah. And then I just read one called A's for Alibi, which is like the beginning of a series by someone called Sue Grafton, and it was terrible. So um, won't be carrying on with that so, series. Bukowski is actually one of my favourite authors, but I like I like really dark books. So, which in many ways kind of works yeah, quite well it, with this because there's there's a lot of darkness and hmm. <laughs> yeah. It was it was just too uh, it was too like too dark for me to um it was yeah. I can't remember what one it was he is kind of a, a horrible but old it was man <laughs> to be fair yeah he's, just, yeah he's not he's not he's just doesn't like people he just no, no. like doesn't like society so yeah so go for it Penny okay I'm Penny I blog at Lilies and Love um it's just a lifestyle blog um but I realized last year-ish um, my old college tutor had a couple of books released and I read to them and then suddenly realized that I hadn't read books for literally years before that I hadn't read anything for probably I'm not lying four or five years I hadn't sat down with a book so I've been trying to read more again now and uh, it's hard finding the time but I'm really enjoying doing it and I've done a couple of reviews for a few bits I've read um, but I like quite um, dark books so I read a lot of sort of biographies of serial killers which I know doesn't <laughs> sound very cheerful but that's the sort of thing I like reading about I like reading about real life crime and stuff like this because like you said this is quite dark um, or some parts of it are that's right up my street cool cool, cool. so should we start uh, get going and sort of start going through some of the questions or uh, you want to, have, have you um, both finished the book by the way I'm about yeah. 60 pages off the end because I was meant to read it at my lunch break and I never got a break today. Okay, well then we we will uh, not mention the ending then because we don't want to ruin it. <laughs> okay. um, but um, I think we can we can kind of answer most of the questions. I actually I did flick through the bits at the end of the book kind of after I read it, but I didn't want to I didn't want to sort of sit down and start thinking too much about the questions because then it's not really a discussion, is it? So um, yeah. So what, what 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 are your sort of what are you guys what are your general opinions of the book? I really like it. Because it's dark. Yeah, I really like it. Yeah, I really, really like it. It's um, 
I like the fact that there's quite a few characters, but you feel like you know them all really well. Um, so I think you know enough about them, and you get to see their past, and you get to know what they're thinking, but it's not too wordy. I get put off by books when they feel like they're just filling up the word count, and I don't feel like this one is. Yeah, I know what you mean, because it's quite a long book as well, and that was my first thought. I was like, is it going to just sort of waffle on in places? But, yeah. And, and I think as well, um, kind of how you're saying, you, you do sort of, you feel almost as though you're in that group of friends, but on the outskirts, kind of watching it happen. That it's yeah. And, I was uh, thinking that, um, sorry, I was thinking that once I was just sitting down, I was just like scribbling down some notes earlier, and I thought, you know what, not an awful lot actually happens, like, aside from there's some sort of big plot points, everything else is just them just living, and yeah. I really liked it that they didn't feel the need to, she didn't feel the need to put in some like big twist or, you know, some big big event. I mean, there's obviously the couple of big events that happen, but other than that, you're just sort of, like you say, you're just living alongside them, just that, going about their lives. Yeah. And I really liked it. Yeah, I think as well, I, I, you know, as you were saying, there are loads of, people, loads of sort of characters in it. And at the beginning, when I, you know, the first couple of, couple of chats, about 50 odd pages or so, I was kind of worried I wasn't going to be able to keep track of them all. And then there was yeah. sort of a, a point when, you know, when you're reading the book and you get past that point when you're yeah. kind of into it and you're just suddenly gone. Yeah. And, um, yeah. I think that definitely happened with them all. And what what I found interesting as well is that it's kind of the cliche that, you know, male writers only ever write strong male characters and kind of weak supporting females and then sort yeah. of vice versa. But actually I think I think uh, the author did really well to write just strong characters of either gender and kind of caught the, like the way they think as well rather than yeah. they weren't yeah. one sided, they were kind of very three dimensional. Yeah. I think so, because there's a lot of, um, although you might not be able to identify with everything that goes on there, I think there's parts of the characters where you think, yeah, I can completely understand how they're feeling, but it's not because they've described how sad they were or how angry they were. It's just the way the situation is. You can really think, well, I know how I'd be feeling in that situation. Yeah. And I th actually, I think that's a good point as well, though, that you know, they are a, quite a different bunch of characters as well, but each of them has got something about them that you can kind of relate to even you know you know if you're not an animator you don't need to be an animator to kind of relate no, exactly. to each of them for example but if you were you would you would so even more but there's each, each character has got something about them which yeah. is, i think is quite interesting even kind of even jules as well you think she thinks she's quite boring and i suppose in some ways she almost is the kind of the the, the one that kind of grounds them all and holds them all yeah. together but there's still a lot about her that you can relate to as well yeah I think yeah. the thing about the Jules, the thing about Jules is um, that she thinks she obviously she's just desperate to be interesting. Like at the beginning of the book, they're the interestings, and she's just desperate for her life to have that kind of meaning. But I think she just she has an ordinary life, but there's and there's nothing wrong with having an ordinary life. You don't have to have a spectacular life. But she she obviously she can't reconcile herself to that. She can't she can't come to terms with the fact that she is just an ordinary person. Yeah. And you know, like that, that that is what most people's lives are like. Most people's lives are just ordinary. They just go about their lives and get on with it and don't don't have spectacular lives. Yeah. But what makes her extraordinary is how everyone likes her. Like all of them, even though yeah. no matter how different they are, all of them like her because she yeah. just she is at the beginning she felt awkward, but as soon as she got into that group of people, she suddenly kind of although she's not completely happy in herself she's not trying to be anything she isn't which i think is a nice thing i think it's quite good as well that obviously she's she's sort of paired up with dennis as well and he actually is happy just being ordinary and, and that yeah. kind of so, sort of some of the conflict always between them comes yeah. up by the fact that she wants to be kind of something more than she is and he's just happy how he is despite you know yeah despite yeah. various issues over the years so um, I think that actually leads us quite well into the first question here, which is uh, who is your favourite character and why? So, do you two want to go first on that one? Mm, go on, Jane. Okay. Um, well, I think, I mean, Dennis is a pretty strong contender because, like you say, he's just, uh, he's just, I had a really strong picture of him in my head as a very, like, he's a big guy and he's just so solid. He's so, like, dependable and he's just always there. But if I was going to pick my favourite character, I think it probably would be Ethan. And I, d I don't know why exactly. Um, I, I don't know. I think he's just... 
he, he's kind of he does have an extraordinary life, an interesting life. He's a, you know he's a huge success, and yet he just he seems so satisfied. He seems like he would have been satisfied had he not had that life, as long as he was doing something that made him happy. Mm. And I, I I loved I did lo I loved that he loved Jules for so long, but never but never did anything about it until that. I don't know how long how far away yeah. you are from the end, Penny. I don't know if you'll have reached a part I was just about to spoil. Um, yeah, he doesn't. It, 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 no, there's no. You know, it's not. That's not the story. The story isn't. Um, it's not even unrequited love. It's just that he's satisfied to love two women at the same time. Mm. You know, and he's with he's with Ash. He's happy to love Jules for all of her life without ever doing anything about it. And I, I just really liked him for that reason. Yeah, see, so yeah, I think I like Ethan, but I like him because he seems to always know the right thing to do and say. He's the sort of person that I can think to myself, like, everyone, I think, in a group of friends, you have, like, the wise one and you have the funny one, and he's the one that you would always go to with a problem. And that's what I really like about him is that he's just there for everybody. And like you said, he came into all that money, but he nothing changed him. He was still exactly the same person he was before, paying for their holidays and taking them out for dinner just because he wanted his friends to be happy. Mm. Yeah. And actually, from his point of view as well, he, he doesn't see anything weird about that because he would expect, you know, he wouldn't hesitate to kind of accept it from them if it was the other way around, I think, as well. He, yeah. he sees them all as this tightly knit group and it doesn't matter who's got money and who, who hasn't. It's just almost yeah. like a communal resource. But Yeah. Um, I, I think mine was probably Jonah. I thought there was, again, it's probably me liking the dark side of things, and he had a lot of kind of tragedy in his life, but I thought it was quite an interesting character as well, because I think as things are slow, kind of slowly revealed, you know, what happened in his childhood and that kind of thing, yeah. it, it, I don't think, you almost don't see it coming, and then it sort of suddenly explains a lot about how he is as well, and um, yeah. I, I, found, I found him the, the one I kind of, because he's probably not included in it as much, because quite often it'll be, you know, the two couples, it'll be Jules yeah. and Dennis and, and Ash and Ethan, and then they'll, they'll just mention him in passing, and I'm kind of like, oh, I want to know a bit more about him. Yeah, and, exactly the same. I felt slightly short-changed on Jonah, yeah. because I wanted to know more. You know, I wanted to really have a, a huge amount of focus on him at points, and it was mm. like, you got a little bit, and then you would, I felt I was left wanting more quite a lot with him. Mm. Yeah. But again, I think it's a hard one, because most of the most of the characters were kind of really interesting as well. I think mean, for me anyway, there were probably maybe like a couple of characters who I wasn't really too bothered about. But it's easier to pick the ones that I didn't particularly like than the ones that I most liked because yeah. I liked most of them. So Yeah. I think the ironic thing with the title is the ones that had the most focus on them are the ones that weren't as interesting. It was like the characters yeah. in the background that I wanted to know more about. Yeah that like Jonah and like Goodman, you don't yeah. really find out a huge amount about Goodman. And I'd like to probably know more about why he turned out the way he did. Well, yeah. Could it, could it even maybe be though that they are actually all interesting and, and, and we kind of feel like that, but if there'd been more focus on those characters and less on say Ash and Ethan, then maybe we'd then be like, oh, those, those are really interesting. Yeah. I want to know more because you can't really get that yeah. balance because you, and I suppose in a way that's kind of like, it, it's kind of like what growing up is as well, you know, you have your friends and your childhood and you lose touch with some of them and you see some more yeah. of some of them and less of others. And it's kind yeah. of kind of a similar thing, isn't it, I suppose? Mm. Well, yeah, because you, you, you always wonder about the ones, like almost like the ones that got away, it's like, what would, what are they doing? You know, yeah. what yeah. what is that all doing right now? Because I don't know anything, you know, there's a couple of people, I was thinking about the other day, there's a couple of people from my class, most of most of the people in my class are on Facebook, there's just a couple and you just think, what happened to them, you yeah. know, yeah. leading these, really these crazy lives or, you know, just boring somewhere, yeah. but you yeah. like think, you like think it's a bit more interesting than, than just a boring life somewhere. Yeah, no. Uh, well, I think as well with people on Facebook, they, you know, people only ever post the highlights, no one ever posts just sort of just sit and watch any standards or whatever so it seems yeah. like everyone's lives are more, more exciting than they are but I guess the, the equivalent is almost in, in this when um, you know when Ash and Ethan send out those those Christmas letters every year and they say oh we're doing all of this and we're doing all of that and, and yeah. I think Jules is quite in, inferior then but actually most of the time they are probably just not, not really doing much yeah so exactly. you'd have Ethan up in, in up in his studio all the time and <laughs> so yeah, yeah. 
So, That's what I like about right. it as well. Sorry. I was just I liked I liked the structure of it for that reason that you got kind of you got sort of two like you, the beginning of the book was them at the camp and then you sort of jumped immediately to that scene with the with the Christmas letter mm -hmm. and it's a bit like oh my god what's happened kind of thing you know what's happened in those intervening years and then you got to fill in all the blanks and th like you say you got to then realize that actually you know they're not leading this perfect amazing crazy life that there is there are flaws in their life yeah we're going to move on to the next question. So that's the, there's a, there are many different kinds of couples in the interesting, so which one is your favourite and why? Mm. We've sort of touched on the individual characters, but we haven't looked at that, that pairing off of those. Mm. And it does depend what you, you call a couple, because, you know, would you have uh, Jules and Ethan as a couple? Although they never yeah. properly coupled up, but they sort of did right yeah. at the beginning, I suppose. I don't know, that's really difficult, because if it was... Like you said, it depends on the context. If you're looking at friendship, I love what Ethan and Jules have because it is just kind of a best friend you know you can rely on mm. no matter what, um, which I think a lot of us would love to have if we don't already have friends that you can grow up with and just they're going to be there even when you're old and your kids are going to play together. But if you're looking at a romantic couple, probably I like Dennis and Jules just because they're so normal. They've got problems but they're in love and you just think it's just a normal life yeah yeah I think probably I'd agree Dennis and Jules but I think I think that um yeah it's the way it's I guess it's the way it's written is that we get to see the inside of their marriage and it seems it you know it's really strong it survives you know his depression and yeah and Ethan and Ash obviously have a very happy marriage as well, but there's almost like you don't really get to see inside it quite so much. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I feel like I, I, I don't feel like I understand their relationship as well as I understand Dennis and Jules. And I feel like knowing everything we do about Dennis and Jules' relationship, it's like, well, that's, that's a brilliant relationship. It really, really works. Like yeah. I, I find it quite a hard one to answer because I think I, I'd probably go for. Uh, for Ethan and Ash, just because I think in some ways, I because I, I really like Dennis, I, you know, how you say he's like a really nice guy as well, and at some points I sort of felt like Jules was messing him around a bit when she was, yeah. you know, when she, she wouldn't sort of be happy with what they had, and yeah. that kind of, it almost kind of then passed on to me, then I was like, oh, there's something not quite right with this relationship, you know, um, mm -hmm. but I suppose the interesting thing is, is all of the relationships in it are all shown with the the, the, the problems that you know that there, there are in them. So, but um, yeah, yeah I, I don't think I could go for um, Jules and Dennis just just for that reason. <laughs> yeah, saying that, I felt my heart broke for him when she said to him mm -hmm. about um, she's not happy that they'll never have the lifestyle, and he just yeah. turned around to her and said, "Because I don't earn enough." Yeah, you're never going to be happy with me because I don't earn enough. And I just thought I can imagine her going, "Oh God, I didn't mean that. I yeah. didn't mean it." But I can completely understand him as I know with equal opportunities now. But I think the men quite often still want to feel like they're the breadwinners. Mm. And yeah. so for her to make him feel like he wasn't good enough because he wasn't pulling in the way that Ethan yeah. was, I did feel really bad for him then. Well, I think as well you've got to bear in mind at the time when when that part of the story was set as well that wasn't necessarily kind of now so it was even more so that, that the men were the breadmen is there so you know um especially i think that 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 particular part was sort of late 90s early noughties which you know yeah it's relatively recent but especially for a, you know a big strong guy like him as well he's kind yeah. of gonna want to mm -hmm. like the man um so the events in the book's opening scene stay in the memories of some of the characters all the way through their lives uh, does the interesting make you reconsider mo moments in your adolescence? If so, which moments and why? Mm, blow me. That's that's one hell of a question, isn't it? Um, I was thinking about this driving home from work today, thinking, what has it made me think about when I was younger? And I dropped out of school early. I dropped out when I was 13, so I didn't have any of them teenage years. And so I was thinking to myself, like, I wonder if I would have made any friendships that lasted all that long. Like, you know, just that thing where you think to yourself, I wonder if, I wonder if. But then I've got my one of my best friends I've known since I was three. And it just, again, made me think about how she's 
been there through so much and still nothing's changed. And we still laugh about things that happened when we were in the playground when we were five. And we'll still just have tears of laughter. And you just suddenly think, I think friendship can go through a lot and not change. But then equally, people can grow apart. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, I think from my point of view that it doesn't kind of make me reconsider anything specific, but it does make you think a lot about the, you know, the people you've, you've kind of, you know, that have been along the way, for example, and, you know, you're reading about them having their first kisses or whatever, and then it makes you kind of think of your own and it, it yeah. kind of takes you back to that period in your childhood. And although, obviously, we, we don't have really have the equivalent of kind of summer camps in Britain, that, you know, yeah. there's still things... Like it reminds a lot of it reminded me of um, we went on a Duke of Edinburgh trip when I was at secondary school when I was about fourteen and loads of us went on that and just kind of reading it through almost kind of the, like the, the kind of the smells of like the disinfectant in the shower rooms and all this kind of stuff like I was kind of kind of remembering that kind of thing and I think like the it, first bit of freedom that yeah, you know, it was exactly. suddenly not with your parents and you suddenly think oh my god I can do whatever I want yeah suddenly you're an adult and you're like wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think the problem. I think the problem with the the book with the jewels certainly is that she she almost she sort of places too much importance on those moments in her life, doesn't she? Like it it all stems from the spirit in the woods, and I, obviously she meets her best friends there and everything, but she can't ever sort of escape that feeling of wanting to get yeah. that back. And and I I like yeah. to think that I I cherish my memories, but I try not to be like you know be like that to be like it was such a great time because you, I mean I went just looking back a few years I went to um, I stayed I lived in America for four months when I was at university I did a, a semester at American University and I was so homesick I, I was miserable for quite a lot of the time and even a year later when I was thinking this time a year ago I was doing this in America and I had this nostalgic feeling of like oh maybe it wasn't maybe it wasn't that bad and then I think, no, it really was. It really was that bad. <laughs> you know, I was miserable. So I try not to, like, I try to be quite, um, you know, I try to stand back and think I have all these wonderful memories of my like, adolescence and my childhood and everything, but I try not to look at them through rose-tinted glasses. Yeah. You know, I try and, like, be quite quite practical about them. So, yeah. I think that's a good point, actually, because I was saying earlier, it's actually my birthday tomorrow. I, I turned 25 tomorrow. So I'm, I'm, I'm not quite having a midlife crisis, but I am like I've been, I, well I guess I've been, I've been kind of working full time, sort of three years after uni, and um, like as of late I've just been thinking, oh wasn't, wasn't uni brilliant? And then almost, even going back to high school, I remember I hated high school, but I have these memories, yeah. and I'm like, oh that wasn't so bad. I, I, I actually <laughs> reread a, a Kestrel for a Knave the other day, which we did, we studied in school, and I remember hating that as well, and I've just read it, and I was like, oh this is brilliant, and. <laughs> I mean, listening, to, like, listening to the offspring in some 41 and going through all these things I used to like when I was about 15 and um, and it's really it's really weird because you can kind of remember how you were the first time around and it, it is very much you sort of have these this kind of this you, you only remember the good times but then yeah, yeah, definitely. if you properly think about it you're like hang on a minute I was miserable at this point in my life yeah and I think it's because we yeah. compare it to being an adult and having all these decisions yeah. making bills to pay yeah, yeah. we want to go back yeah, you can't blame us really for when, when for that, but but yeah, and and I think with the character in the book as well, I think Jules is the only one who doesn't. She never actually kind of looks at it that cynically and thinks actually it wasn't perfect. You know, the rest of them, as much as the rest of them enjoyed it, you know, yeah. none of the rest of them are crazy enough to to apply to to run the camp, for example. Yeah. But then I think Jules is the only one that feels like she's got something, like she felt something, she had something to escape from. So yeah. she looked at it as her. She, it really is her moment of like yeah. epiphany. It's her moment of my life can be so much better than it is. Whereas all the others already have this sort of. I know that they all have their problems, like in their mm -hmm. families, but a certain amount of privilege and everything. And she just discovers this whole new world. So I think you can almost forgive her for looking back on it that way. And and but. She, my problem with her is that she looks back on it that way, but she lets it completely rule her life. She lets yeah. it, you know, she lets it ruin her life so, to a certain extent. You know, she manages to to move on, but she it constantly holds her back and it constantly causes her problems. And that's my main problem with her is that she doesn't, she can't get past it. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Well, so next question. I'm just conscious we've got loads of questions, and we could, I think, we could quite easily talk about this for several hours, but. <laughs> <laughs> going to get dark at some point. <laughs> um, 
So, despite wanting to, Jules can't make herself fall in love with Ethan. Do you wish you were able to? I guess um, we kind of no. we kind of touched on this earlier a little bit, but yeah. well, we, do you not? Why not? Tricky one. I I'm of the opinion that. Yeah, I think yeah. she'd be one of those. She'd be one of those sort of horrible wives that <laughs> that he's working really hard, and then she just sort of gets the rewards of it without. And mm. and I think you're right as well. I don't think she'd she'd treat him properly. I think if she maybe if if she could treat him the way that Ash does, then maybe. But I don't think she would. Yeah, because I think for Ash, she's always had money, hasn't she? So she never, she doesn't. I mean, it's more. It, she's got more money as a, as Ethan's wife than she had as in her family. But it's not like she's gone from having nothing to having loads. So I think she's able to sort of, you know, make that transition. She still wants to work. She still wants to do her own thing. Whereas I think Jules would have gone from having absolutely nothing with her mum to having this huge amount of wealth. And I don't think she would have necessarily dealt with it particularly well. No, and she strikes me as the sort of woman who would, obviously he has to work really, really hard to build it up when he first gets interest, and I, she's she's not selfish, but she's quite sort of self-focused, yeah. and I can imagine her not being happy that he wasn't focusing all his time and attention on her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, what, what I think as well, actually, is um, obviously with Ash, even though he's got all the money, she was still out doing her thing, and she was kind of, and she was actually making a bit of a name for herself, you know, to, to direct and, and write and plays and things. And, yeah. And Jules obviously had her stab at being an actress and sort of gave it up basically because she wasn't very good. And yeah. and I think I have this horrible feeling that if they got all this money, she would be trying to be an actress and she'd just be a bad actress, but she wouldn't yeah. have to worry about it because the money would come in from him. Whereas Ash was still, even if like if he'd not been there, she was making her own way in the world. Yeah. I agree. And, and she got the respect that, you know, that comes with that as well, whereas Jules would have just been, you know, some bimbo. The tabloids would have walked all over her, wouldn't they? <laughs> <laughs> cool. So, um, oh, that's an interesting one. So, do Ethan's conflicted feelings about Mo change the way you see him? Um, how do you feel about his deception of Ash? And what do you think North is trying to achieve by introducing this element into Ethan's character? Three questions for Um have you how far have you got, Penny? Have you have you you know what the deception is, don't you? Do you? Is Penny there? Yeah. Are you I there, Penny? Oh, okay. oh, can you hear me? I'm sure you're if you're sixty pages from the end, you're a bad. Yeah, can you hear me? You keep cracking. Well, no. I just realised I've got a book in my hand, so I can check. Oh, there we go. Yeah, that's a good job. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Can you, yeah. Can you hear us? Yeah, you disappeared for a while. Oh, oh dear. I think that's a bit. I think there's a bit of a delay. Yeah. Um. Well, basically, the way I see it is, I, I, um. It didn't. It didn't. It, I suppose it changed the way I see. I saw Ethan because, you know, obviously it's a different facet to his character. But I don't think I. I don't think I really lost respect for him because, I think it's probably a common a common problem amongst parents who have children with developmental issues. Is you know suddenly, well maybe not suddenly, but you know there's this there's this diagnosis. All of a sudden. You know, you've got to come to terms with it, and mm. yeah, I don't, I don't think, I think it just added another, another layer to his character. So I didn't, I didn't disres I didn't lose respect for him as a result of it. I think actually, it's the logical conclusion anyway of his personality. He's obviously quite a perfectionist and really driven, and and for him to have a son that that can't necessarily do that would have been kind of pretty heartbreaking yeah. from his point of view. But it's it's a shame he can't kind of put all of his, his love in there but I think he's so in love with his work and so busy doing his work as well that there's only so much of him to give and I think he just sort of I don't know I, I guess he, he struggles with it doesn't he but that's kind of what makes what makes him interesting yeah I think possibly he had quite a difficult start to life as well because obviously they 
at the beginning of the book, they were very focused on his appearance. Mm. And I think possibly because he didn't have the easiest start to life, you're always going to be thinking, I want my child to be perfect. Mm. Yeah. And with, with the amount of money he has as well, I think he thinks, you know, mm. it should be, he should be able to fix yeah. it. He should be able to, you yeah. know, there should be nothing that he can't fix. And he can't, obviously you can't fix something like that with money. So I think there's a, an element of frustration for him as well. He's all, everything else, they all go to him and he's always fixed everything. Mm. Well, I, I think that's kind of interesting because, I, and a part of this question is, what, you know, what do you think the author is trying to achieve with that? And there's almost a contrast between, you know, um, the, the, his money has, has been able to kind of fix a lot and, and uh, you know, for Jules that would be a huge deal if she could have that money, uh, that kind of money. But, but she wants the money, whereas on the other hand he would give up all of his money to be able to fix it. So it's kind of showing that actually money can't buy everything, even though Jules yeah. kind of thinks it can. Uh, what do you think of Dennis and of his relationship with Jules? Do you sympathise more with him or with her? Um, I sympathise. I sympathise sympathise with both of them, but I think the the problem is that she. I sympathise with him because I think she could make a conscious decision to say, "That's it. I'm done being jealous. I'm done being uh, caught up on you know what they've got and what we haven't." Whereas obviously he's got a mental illness and mm. he can't he can't help it obviously so yeah. I, I feel sorry for her because obviously you know I'm sure living with depression like that must be awful when it obviously went on for many years but I think that um, he couldn't help it and I think she could have sat herself down and gone this is it I'm getting over this now and she didn't so I, I, I kind of agree with you I sympathize with him a, a, quite a lot more and I almost feel as though actually obviously his initial kind of rut with the depression was due to you know the clash of the meds and then changing that around but I almost feel as though he then actually got stuck there because of her if you know what I mean the way that her own negative outlook on life and obviously it, it didn't help like him but they've kind of mutually brought each other down in a way because she brought him down and then he brought her down and it just yeah. sort of seemed to spiral yeah. but um but like you said I almost feel as though he couldn't really help it whereas she could so it, it feels as though she was the only one that could get them out of that that sort of cycle, and yeah. she didn't really. Yeah. She was too yeah. busy kind of feeling sorry for herself to feel sorry for him in a way. I don't think she was very supportive, um, and every time she was sort of sitting down, I felt and saying, "I'm really worried about him." It always seemed to be that it was actually she was worried about how mm -hmm. what effect it was having on her. Yeah. It was never worried about the children or worried about him as such. It was just literally about the fact that she couldn't deal with it, yeah. which I, n I can't imagine how hard it must be. But I just felt sorry for Dennis because I didn't feel like he had the support there that he needed to have. Yeah. Yeah. And actually, I think that the kind of the kid coming along into that household sort of saved, saved things for them, really, you know. Yeah. And, but, but, yeah. but it's kind of interesting, though, because it, it almost saved things not because of how you traditionally think of, you know, the kid coming in and then two parents rally around the child. It was actually that it came along and then, and then that brought Dennis out of his depression. And then once that happened, everything then was kind of, it was the other way around. It was kind of an upward spiral. So yeah. It's quite interesting. So um, what do you think of Ethan giving financial help to Jules and Dennis? Is it an appropriate expression of friendship? Um, would, you, would you have taken the money? Yeah. I would, yeah. Yeah. I don't. I don't know. I'd want to, but I would always feel like it changed the friendship into a business arrangement. I, yeah. I would take it with that heartbeat. I'd be like, right, cheers. I'd, I'd um, I'd note it down. I'd remember that they lent me the money, and if I ever came into enough money to pay them back, or even if, you know, if if that was enough for them to to in the, the place where they were to. Maybe if it got their, their house sorted and Jules got her practice sorted and she could start paying some money back, you know, yeah, that yeah. would be the way I'd, I'd think about it. But I, I you know, I, I think as well what was interesting is that I don't. It would be wrong of them to go and ask for the money, but because it was offered, I kind of feel as though, you know. Yeah, and it was offered. <laughs> it was offered uh, like a couple of times mm. and it refused and refused, right. and then in the end, he was like, "You need to get out of this place." Like. Dennis is depressed. 
this place yeah. isn't helping. Yeah. This, you know, it's not just about here. I've got all this money and I can make your yeah. life like better, like or more interesting. It's I can literally make your life better. You can you can start to move on from this horrible time that you've had. So I think mm. in the end, it was you know it was the right thing to do, and he he basically sort of forced it on them, and that that's the only way to do it. That's, you've got to have it. That's it. I'm going. Just take it. I'm going. So, yeah. The thing is, I think any everyone always says. Oh, you're Yeah, you're breaking up. Can you hear me? Yeah. It's me now. Try again. Yeah. Um, no, I was just saying that if you were in a position, say you win the lottery, everyone will always say, I'd give as much support. want to give that money. You skipped out again a bit, but I think we got the gist of it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna say as, as well. I, I think because um, didn't Ash try and offer the money as well? So it's not. I think if it had just been Ethan, you'd be kind of a bit like, well, is he just doing yeah. that because he's kind of in love with you? But when there's, when there's Ash as well, who's also like seriously just take the money. It's kind of like, well, you know, they they are just trying to help. It's not just like Ethan being like throwing his money at me, trying to get me to bail yeah, exactly. or whatever. It's, it is actually there. They're, they're yeah. trying to help. Um, yeah. But I think it's always going to be a, diff a difficult one. Um, I mean, it's one of those basic rules, isn't it? I, you know, I try not to even borrow like a fiver off a friend because I don't want the awkwardness of them them having to ask me to pay it back or or me being like, yeah. sorry, or, you know. So, um, but when it's a huge sum of money that you know you can't can't pay back as well, I suppose it does change things. But yeah. but then again, I suppose there had been friends friends for years as well, and so it's not just like someone you've only known six months. No, it's not like they. It's not like they could ever be accused of only being friends with them because of the yeah, money. Exactly. You know, they were best friends. Yeah. And as well, I think it was in the grand scheme of things, it was a relatively small amount of money. You know, a hundred thousand dollars when he was obviously, you know, a millionaire is is a drop in the ocean to him. Mm. And I think. If you really sat down and thought about it, you'd have to think that way. You know, if, if you can immeasurably improve your life without making even yeah. the smallest amount of difference to his life in, in financial terms, you know, I, I think you'd have to take it in the end, wouldn't you? Yeah. I guess, though, in some ways, because obviously he did a lot of work, um, you know, trying to improve the working conditions of the, of the people working in his factories and stuff as well, though. And almost the fact that he's doing that charity work has got to almost be a bit like a kick in the teeth to. If you then take take his money, because it's always like you're one of those charity cases. Yeah. Because you know I mean? yeah. he's obviously yeah, got, he's got enough money that he can have anything he wants, and then that's when he starts trying to do a bit of good. But yeah, I, I don't think you'd ever get away from feeling like you were a charity case, would yeah. you? You'd, you'd never, yeah. never be able to get past that. Tricky one. So um. Next question. Do you sympathise with the way the characters had to adjust their expectations about life, love and greatness? Um, yeah, but I don't know if I ever really have, sort of. I know I just said I try not to be nostalgic, mm. but it's it's a sad moment when you realise that you have to adjust your expectations. Yeah. Isn't it? You suddenly yeah. like, oh, my life isn't going to turn out the way I expected it to. And I still think, I'm like 31, and I still think... Mm. You know, oh, maybe it will. Maybe things will be the way I like expected them to be. But I don't know. There's a fine line between, you know, not giving up on all of your dreams and adjusting yeah. your expectations. I think. Yeah, yeah, that is true. As you're growing up, you have all these big plans for the future, but you get to a point where you realise that it's not going to be achievable. You have to start living in the real world. Yeah, just be practical, yeah. really, don't you? Yeah. I think I think it's finding the compromise, isn't it, without actually letting letting go of those dreams as well. I think um, Jules is the best example of it as well, with her kind of dreams of becoming a, a, a an actress, and then actually she finds out she's she's just not that good. And yeah, mo most people, you know, like when I was younger, I wanted to be a rock star. That was that was my thing. I can play guitar. That's about as far as I got. You know, and and it's very unlikely I'm going to become a rock star. And over time, I've kind of come to realise that. And I, I think most people have a similar thing, whether you know whether they want to be an astronaut or whether even if they want to be the best chef in the country, the odds of you becoming the best chef in the country are pretty slim. Yeah. <laughs> you, have, you have to, I suppose, 
readjust yourself to the fact that you might have to just make do with being a really good chef. Yeah. But I think it's, it is interesting because I think all of them go through that in many ways and obviously I think Ash is still trying to get kind of get further even though she's got to a certain extent and and Ethan obviously got to the top of kind of his career and then he, he almost starts like well he starts making mistakes by doing kind of naff spin-offs and doing sort of questionable yeah. things here and there and almost sort of you know it's once you get to the top I suppose even then you've got to stay at the top and you've also got to kind of keep thinking well what am I going to do next because you can't there's exactly. always going to, there's always going to be a, somewhere greater than where you are now I suppose yeah and there's always someone vying for your space as well so you have to keep yeah. yourself relevant or mm. find something to improve it yeah so the next question we've got is uh the interesting is divided into three parts which are moments of strangeness big land, uh, or big land and the drama of the gifted child it says do you think these titles and the divisions they create are particularly meaningful to the story um i'll be honest when i was actually reading through it I didn't really pay much attention to them. But I, I didn't. Think kind of, no, I but didn't. I, but I think in hindsight, when you look back at them, it, it almost makes more sense in hindsight, if that yeah. makes sense. I, I think, um, yeah, I think it's kind of more a thing if you read it through a second time, that then they'll, you know, when you watch a film the second time or, yeah. or the book, and you kind of start picking up on stuff that you didn't see the first time yeah. around. I think that's something like that, and I bet there's loads of other stuff as well. Probably, yeah. If, particularly in that, if you if we if you were to reread that first opening section when they're all in the camp together, when yeah. you know now how they've all kind of grown up and what's happened, it would it would read yeah. completely differently. And I think this is probably almost a case of that as well. So what do you guys think? No, I agree. I didn't. It didn't even occur to me. In the first, the the moments of strangeness. I don't even think I noticed that it was called that because I would have just gone in straight no. at the first page, like the first page of writing. And then when I was reading it, I suddenly thought, how is this divided up? And obviously then mm. I saw that it was Figland and the drama of the gifted child. But like you say, I think I probably would want to read it through it well, would want to read it through again to, to sort of mm. work out what relevance they have, really. I mean, obviously the drama of the gifted child is the book that Ash yeah. refers to all the time. Yeah. And uh, and I, I suppose, yeah, I suppose all that sort of comes to comes to a point, doesn't it? Like, you know, with Ethan, he's the the, the essential, he's the the quintessential gifted child, mm -hmm. and then you've got Goodman, who obviously he he's not so gifted, but um, yeah, he certainly has a fair amount of drama. But yeah, I don't, I, I agree. I d I didn't take much notice of them throughout the book itself. Yeah, I didn't. I completely agree. It was only when I was sort of flicking through the pages, um, I suddenly thought, realised even that they'd been divided up. Mm. Yeah. As you're reading it, I was so lost in the story that I just wouldn't have noticed it. No, and I mean, the, the story was, it wasn't like it was divided, it didn't feel divided into three parts. Yeah. I, I didn't think, oh, that's the end of one part and we're moving on to another, because yeah. I think, like I said, the structure was so sort of non-linear anyway that it was you know it wasn't like I had felt there were three distinctive sections to the story at all. Yeah that's the thing I mean it's divided into chapters as well and it almost doesn't feel as though it's divided that way either it, it is just like kind of watching life un unfold in front of you and yeah. even, even though it's not linear it's almost it's a similar thing it's kind of like you kind of watching life unfold and then you kind of not exactly flashbacks but you kind of yeah. sort of think back to your memory and that's what I thought it was like, someone telling you a story, and yeah. when they'll go, oh, and then, I mean, because then we were living there, and, yeah. and yeah. you're like, oh, what? how did you end up there? And they're like, oh, well, years before that, we'd done this, and that's how you would tell your like, sort of life story, or yeah. even just a short, yeah. a short a story of your week. You wouldn't necessarily go, well, we did this on Monday, and then mm. we just did this on Tuesday, you know. So I felt that that's, that's what I liked about it, is that it felt like someone sort of telling you the story of these six people. Yeah, that's exactly what I thought. I felt like... Um, it reminds me of when you sit down with your grandparents and they're telling you a story and they're here and they're there and they're everywhere but eventually it all ties yeah. up to an end yeah. Exactly. yeah yeah cool and so we've got um, what rules the money and class play in fostering talent in the interesting and if you think about Jules and Ash would their lives have been different if their circumstances have been different and do you think their children's lives will be affected by their parents, parents experience as well another quite long winded question isn't it but 
I, I think I think with most people it's probably um, a mixture of money, like the money and the talent. I suppose, like you know, it's almost that Jules had kind of well, Jules had no money and no talent really. <laughs> but um, I, I guess Ash had got a bit of money and a bit of talent, and that was enough. But then you've got Ethan. Um, I, I, get, I can't really remember. I don't think it really went much into his family background, but I'm guessing they had enough money, and then he had a lot of talent. But you yeah. kind of, you can't. I guess you need both really to be able to to support it. I guess if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I think in terms of the ch their children, I think it's interesting that you know their children are they're born in the 90s, and mm. and I mean obviously uh, the daughter of um, Ash and Ethan, whose name I can't remember, is yeah, something silly. Know. Aurora. That's what it. is it? Aurora. Right. Yeah, no, no, the other one. What's the other one called? Oh, yeah, no, that was, uh, yeah, Rory. Oh, uh, what, Larkin? Sorry. Larkin, that's yeah. it. Yeah. She is obviously a privileged child, and we don't really get to, we don't really get to know an awful lot about what she becomes. Obviously, there is reference to her in the final sort of pages, but, um, but Aurora, Rory, she just seems completely happy. She's mm. completely happy to be doing what she wants to do. And there's nothing there's no she has no like she doesn't seem to have any class issues. Mm. She went to, you know, a, a state university, mm. what what she wants to do and now she's doing a job she wants to do. And that's that's all that matters. And so it just goes to show you how I think class barriers have sort of broken yeah. down it, mm. to a certain extent. I mean she's obviously she's still not upper class but I think that she, you know, she's she has the opportunity to do what she wants to do, regardless of how much money her parents did or didn't have. I think she gets that from Dennis, doesn't she? Yeah, definitely. Not certainly not from Jules. <laughs> yeah. No, I don't feel like their money or um, the lifestyle they've got made a huge amount of difference. I did wonder uh, when I was reading it whether Jules would have built such a strong friendship with Ash if it wasn't that she was so sort of. Um, amazed by the life that she had. Um, yeah. yeah. Whether that would have been as strong or whether she would have kept going back there or whether it was just she was so overwhelmed by it and then a friendship was bred. But there's no way of knowing. No. I think I... it's interesting as well to wonder if, because obviously Ash has money and is, so is therefore, like we said, she's, she was able to pursue a dream of working in the theatre. But then I think the same is true to a certain extent of Ethan. That he, like you say, he obviously, I think his his parents divorced. I think that's all we really know about. His mum ran away with the paediatrician, didn't she? Yeah. And and so, that, but there's obviously was it sort of enough money as he was growing up, and then and his school fostered his talent. But then he he's with Jules. Uh, sorry, he's with Ash, who has money, and so he is almost independently. They're independently wealthy, so it allows him to follow his dream. If he had no money at all, would he have become the raging success he, he became you know but is, is talent enough just to carry you through or do you have to have sort of a certain amount of wealth behind you in order to pursue yeah. that dream you know this thing because he doesn't put much um weight on the money side of things when um was it old what was his name old mo uh, yeah, when he was oh, yeah. yeah he had the opportunity to go and work with the big yeah. time and he turned it down for someone that he cared about. So I think money's always been secondary to him. Yeah. Well, I, think, I, I think it's interesting you mention that though, because if his if his, if he was in different circumstances and his family had no money, you know, he wouldn't have gone to Spirit in the Woods and he wouldn't have met Old Mo Templeton. And he's the reason he got into the, really into the animation. So yeah. his 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 circumstances in particular could be you know very different. Mm, I, I yeah. Think, um, probably more so than any of the others because. You, you know, I, I think that's where he got that drive to go and do it, it was because of old mate. Yeah. And actually as well, I think that this question ends on, you know, do you think their children's lives will be affected? And um, I think the way the book kind of leaves off, it sets it almost up perfectly for that cycle to be repeated and all of those kids to go off the camp and make new friends. And so it's almost, you obviously you don't know whether it will be or not because it's the same as with the first group of them. You know, yeah. you, you, you don't know whether... You know whether that whether the wealth difference between Jules and Ash whether that did cause their friendship or not. Yeah. No way of knowing. So there are some more questions here, um, all about the theme of jealousy. So, so 
Okay, so George thinks that de uh, jealousy is defined as I want what you have, and envy is I want what you have, but I also want to take it away so you can't have it. Do you agree with these definitions? Um, no, I don't think so. Um, I would say that jealousy and envy are very much the same thing, but I would say that jealousy is more dangerous than env more dangerous than envy. I think that you can be envious of somebody for what they have, but if you're jealous, I think that's quite a negative thing to be feeling. Yeah, I, I think I probably would agree. I think envy envy can be just quite um, a kind of, um, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, but it, it's very much just, you can just be like, oh, I envy that person, their lifestyle, I envy that person, their hair. But I think, yeah, jealousy is a horrible, horrible emotion. It's, mm -hmm. it's it, like, it can be really destructive. It's not a nice feeling at all being jealous of someone. I, I reckon you're, you're both right and actually I would say that both jealousy and envy can have both, either of those definitions as well I think they're both quite fluid so you could have it the other way around that envy is I want what you have and, and jealousy is that you know that what would destroy yeah. it but yeah. they could be this way around as well I think either of them I, I think there's it's kind of hard to put your finger on what the difference is between the two but yeah. you kind of know that there is one but yeah. I, think, I think it depends how powerful it is because you can be just a little bit jealous of, you know, someone's got a bag of crisps, or you yeah. can be massively jealous that they've got a beautiful wife and a really nice car and an amazing job and they go on holiday all the time. And so, you know, there's different levels along that, along that sort of thing of jealousy, I guess. Yeah. But I think, um, I, I think for me, kind of envy is a lot more about. I, I guess you can kind of almost be jealous of somebody, but not not really mm -hmm. sure why. Whereas I think with envy, that there's always a, like a really definite reason for it yeah. in my head, anyway. So you know, you you might be jealous of someone's lifestyle, but you'd be envious of their car, for example. You could be yeah. specific, maybe. Yeah. So uh, which characters in the book demonstrate envy, and which demonstrate jealousy? That's, that's kind of hard considering what, how we just defined it, I guess. Yeah. Um, God, that is really difficult. I think Jules probably demonstrates both of them in different ways, I guess. Yeah. I don't ever, I'm not sure if I ever feel that she, like, whether or not you define, whichever way you define, I want what you have, but I also want to take it away so you can't have it. I don't, I'm not sure if I ever feel that Jules wants to take away anyone else's or specifically Ash mm. and Ethan's. I don't think she wants to take it away from them necessarily. I think she just wants it as well. She's more than happy to share it with them sort of thing. You know, she she, yeah. she doesn't want to destroy anyone's life in order to make her life better than the you know, than what she thinks it's it is. Yeah. So I don't know if she I don't whichever way you want to define it, I'm not sure she necessarily you know, I don't, I'm not sure she's she's not vindictive about mm. about it, I don't think. Mm. I would say if you were looking at it from that point of view, I want what you've got, it would be, um, I've forgotten his name now, Brian, you know, the oldest singer, and he was taking Jonah's music from him. Oh, yeah, yeah. That oh, then, yeah. He, he does kind of want to destroy it. Like... Yeah, he, he doesn't yeah. care that he doesn't care that there's a victim. Mm. He just is interested in mm. having it for himself. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And uh, I, I, I guess... Because again, there are different levels. Because I guess Ethan's obviously a bit jealous of Dennis because Dennis has got jewels, but he's not nowhere near as jealous of that as as Jules is of his money. I don't think as well. I don't. Yeah. Think, I think he kind of. I guess he kind. Of, he's kind of happy knowing that Jules is happy in a way, whereas Jules isn't necessarily happy knowing that they're happy. Because yeah. <laughs> she's not. <laughs> um, it's having to a rough deal for her, but. It's got here as well. Do you think that she, the, uh, how do you pronounce the author's name? I, I, I don't really want to try it. Um, I don't know. Probably. I'd say one of them. Wallitzer, yeah. But anyway, do you think that Wallitzer presents one as more destructive than the other? And do you think that one's more destructive than the other as well? I, I well, think yeah. we kind of, kind of, it's kind of the same question. We kind of answered all three questions in one. Didn't yeah, we? Yeah. Or were you going to say something? No, I was going to say the same thing. We've already sort of covered yeah. it. We already we went around that. I think it is just very much on on like a sliding scale of it. Yeah. 
Uh, this one's a really long one. Have you got the book in front of you so I don't have to read yeah. the whole thing up? Yeah. Well, basically, it's about the Christmas letter and um, whether Jules ever really conquers her envy. And whether, oh, that's an interesting one. Well, whether you think that the uh, her experiences at Spirit in the Woods actually made her happier. Yeah, because uh, uh, there's an interesting part where she says to her sister, I'm sorry that you were jealous. And her sister says, I, w I wasn't jealous. I wasn't jealous yeah. of you. I just, you know, I, I, w I wasn't. And, and Jules has spent all this time thinking that she's sort of made her sister feel jealous of her. And, and she hasn't. And I, I, I don't know. I, yeah. Do you think her experience of spirits in the, Spirit in the Woods and friendship with the interests actually made her happy? I guess that's just one of those things where I, I often have this thought myself where I think ha, if I'd done something slightly mm. differently would my life how, how different would my life be and would I be happier mm. and I think there's some things where you can go yeah my life would have been better if I hadn't yeah. done that but then other things you think well you know you've just got to accept that this is the way that yeah that I've gone and I suppose in in this case Jules if she hadn't gone and she hadn't made friends with these people maybe she would have been more satisfied with her life because she wouldn't have been exposed to that yeah. level of that disparity of wealth that she obviously has with her friends mm. but then who's to say that she wouldn't have found another thing to be jealous of you know another another way mm. to worry about her own life if she's that kind of person and, and well, I when, think that, when, sorry, sorry go on. You go, Penny. No, you go. Uh, when she went to spirit in the woods she was very much um I don't look right I don't fit in I've got nothing to say for myself and it was spirit in the woods that actually gave her the confidence to just be herself and you are funny and people do want to be around you so I think it probably did make her a better person but like Jane said if she hadn't been around people with money would she have been as jealous or would she have found something else? Well that, uh, what I was going to say is I think again it's really hard to judge because actually Spirit in the Woods is so much of her personality less so than the others but she almost kind of let it define who she is and so yeah. I don't think you can really say whether she'd be happier or not because she wouldn't have been the same person. She'd be a completely. She would have been a completely person. different person. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, that's the end of the questions. There was one thing I wanted to. Uh, to I wanted to give a shout out to Kathy as well because I thought she was a very underrated character as well. Oh yeah. Um, and there are no questions about it about it really as well. And and um, one thing I was going to say that for me that made me think kind of, you know, as as you sort of. They kind of forget about her as, as they all grow up and things, but occasionally they get a glimpse of her and she's kind of a, you know, a CEO of a company and she's doing really well. But it made me think about some sometimes when you meet people and and um, they don't seem very nice. And sometimes you know you meet someone they're really clipped, they're really formal, and they're not very friendly. And you just sort of automatically think, oh, they're not a very nice person. But actually, mm -hmm. you know, everyone's got their own their own history that's behind them, and sometimes you know. You, you don't know why people act like they are. Maybe you know it could be that you know their mom passed away when they were a child or something, and you, you don't know that. And you, yeah, you just make a judgment, don't you, based on yeah. what you're seeing in front of you. And, yeah. yeah. And, and Kathy's character actually made me think of I, like since I read it, I've been thinking a lot more about people and trying to kind of figure out what, like why are you like that? Are, you know, are you just a horrible person, or is or is there something more to it? So, so I thought she's quite an underrated character because she's not in it too much. And actually, with all these questions, we haven't really talked about Goodman much either. I was which, just going to say, we haven't talked yeah. about Goodman. Mm. What a character. What a strange character. Yeah, I, I, I didn't feel about him. I, don't, I didn't like him really that much. Um, I, I felt like in the beginning, if it had been a different type of book, um, uh, Jules would have ended up in a relationship with him or something. Mm. You know, she, she wanted him. He's the cool guy. You know, she, she really sort of desired him. Yeah, and then, yeah. and then it, it obviously, you know, it happened. Whether it happened or didn't happen, I think, you know, I think you can draw your own conclusions. But mm. I, I think it's, I do think it's really interesting. And I, I was thinking about it earlier, and I was thinking about how, essentially, his family, they think they're doing this great thing by, you know, by by sending him money and, mm. and letting him live out his life. And you just think. There's, there's love, there's unconditional love for your child, and then you just think, but you're not really doing him any favours, are you? You know, he's not, he's not no. going to have any, any sort of a life, whether he did it or he didn't. He needs to, you know, he needs to face up to it and yeah. have some sort of a life. And yeah, interesting character, definitely. Mm. I think actually the, the balance of how much he was in it was just about right as well, because I don't think I could have put up with any more of it in there. But, no. but um, 
But that said, when he wasn't there, it was it was interesting to read about him. And just yeah. Not a, a nice person, if you know. And you know when you're kind of morbidly fascinated by by people, you just kind of like, oh, I don't like you, but I'm kind of interested. In, yeah. <laughs> in your life. It's like we just said, though. I want to know more because I'm just like, well, what made him like that? Yeah. He's obviously not a very nice person. Whether he did what they said or he didn't. Mm. the way he goes on to live his life when his family is sending him money and protecting him yeah. and he still lives his life in the way that he chooses and yeah. you think to yourself what made you turn out that way when mm. Ash is so lovely yeah, yeah and, and you think as well because obviously I suppose one of the leading theories for that is that you know she got all the talent and, and he didn't necessarily but he didn't he didn't apply himself he didn't try you know and and I think yeah. you know how you've got you've got he kind of contrasts with, with Dennis who's Again, he's not necessarily got a huge amount of talent or a huge amount of flair or something, but he just gets on with it and he enjoys yeah. his life, you know, despite of it. And and if anything, Goodman had got more advantages because he's got the money behind him as well, and you know, and his parents were supported, even though you know, what was it? He wanted to be an architect or whatever it was he wanted to do, and yeah, there's no reason why he couldn't have done it, but he just sort of threw it all away. And it's, I guess I think he did want to grow up because his last day or his last morning at Spirit in the Wood. Mm. You're cracking up again, Penny. Just sat there and you just think, hello? Yeah, I think yeah. I'm back again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah on his yeah. last morning at Spirit in the Woods, he just sat brooding on his own. And I just got the feeling that he couldn't cope with the fact that he had to yeah. grow up and get a job. Yeah. Which is kind yeah. of, I suppose, quite difficult for most of the people in it. George didn't really like doing that either, did she say? No. no, there's obviously a difference, isn't there, between that, like, not wanting to do it, but knowing you have to, mm. and then, you know, not like wanting to do it, it and, yeah. yeah, exactly running away from it, because you can't run away, you can't run away from life, as everyone always says, you know, you run, but it's still there, and um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't like him, and the more we saw of him throughout the book, I was just like, yeah, I don't like you.